really need to keep this slide. I, until a few days ago, I thought I was coming down and, I, you know, I'm, I'm sad it hasn't worked out that way. But, you know, that's life and, and sort of where we are. But I kept this slide, I kept this, uh, the, the title slide in because I just think this is such a wonderful photograph of uh, the crested kua, kua cristata, uh, uh, taken by a, a good friend, Ken Behrens. So, uh, so I, what a beautiful bird, what a beautiful bird, called the Tivuk in Madagascar. So, uh, so how do I go to the next slide? Oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, so what I'm going to be talking about and my love of elephant birds uh, grew out of the research that I did for a book that I published earlier this year. And uh, um, the book, uh, it, 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 it goes from the deep past 250 million years ago up to uh, the present. It's, it's a story of change uh, and a very long journey. And I, I just wanted to say that for me, the writing of this book was very much the same. It was a long journey and a story of change. It's the first time I've uh, written an extended piece for general readers. Uh, and I can tell you there was an enormous amount of back and forth with my editor where I would periodically send chapters and say, well, I think this is quite good, to which my editor would respond, uh, I am not interested in whether you think it's any good. The question is, will any readers think it's interesting? So uh, I, I've tried and I hope that I have succeeded. There are three threads that make their way through this book and are, and are interwoven. Um, and one of them is my own research. Uh, I began working in Madagascar for my PhD in 1970-71. I spent 18 months there then studying these great white lemurs. Um, and I have been carrying on research on various aspects of their lives uh, since then. Uh, they're really interesting and on whatever is on whatever is left um, and so uh, a, a question that sort of I have pursued uh, since then is why is this why why are the the normal uh, roles between males and females in monkeys and apes our closest relatives I'll leave you to decide for our own species but in monkeys and apes males are generally bigger than females and socially dominant to them and can displace them from feeding trees and so on and so forth so that's one thread in this book though the book is not primarily about lemurs I should say uh, the second is that uh, even way back in 1970 uh, 50 years ago now, uh, there was uh, an environmental challenge already evident. And uh, it just seemed to me early on that I couldn't just study these animals, that I had to roll up my sleeves and get involved and uh, work with colleagues who have become friends in Madagascar uh, in trying to ensure that uh, there would be a future for them. So uh, a big piece of my life for the last 50 years alongside doing research has been uh, working with local communities and with colleagues at the university in the capital uh, on community, what would generally be called community-based conservation. And then the third thread came about when I met this uh, a very interesting long archeologist at Yale in 1974 who was actually doing his PhD in Taiwan at the time, but Taiwan was not a good place to continue doing research. And I kept saying, well, you know, Madagascar is really interesting. Anyway, the upshot of that was uh, marriage followed. And uh, my late husband uh, uh, was an archeologist who worked in Madagascar uh, for the next 38 years. And uh, he broadened my horizons uh, not just back through the human settlement of Madagascar, but way back further than then. So, uh, so, so the so the book weaves those threads together, uh, and somewhere in all of that emerged uh, elephant birds, uh, who uh, won my heart. Um, but before we get to elephant birds, just for a moment. Um, 
if if the lemurs I mean, I mean, and i'll come back to this at the end because i really want to hear what you know and what you think and your ideas about this if if the lemurs are, are odd and interesting so are the birds uh the birds of the, the 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 birds as an array in madagascar uh show uh, a great deal of diversity uh but uh uh, sorry, a great deal of endemism. Uh, many species are found nowhere else in the world other than Madagascar, but the diversity of lineages present is lower than one would expect for an island that is a thousand miles long and 350 miles wide. It's the fourth biggest island in the world. And if you line up uh, the bird array of Madagascar against comparable and, and, and control for sort of surface area of, of Madagascar and other uh, regions of the world. Uh, the birds of Madagascar um, come out as odd in this uh, high endemism, low diversity uh, 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 dimensions. Um, and th there are species, there are families, uh, lineages that you would expect to be there the you know the, the the honey guides of Africa, the hornbills of Africa, uh, the woodpeckers. Where are they? Why why aren't they in Madagascar? Why didn't they get across the Mozambique Channel as so many other birds did? So there is a there is a an as yet unsolved mystery, uh, uh, as well as the the magic and and the beauty of uh, of the birds that that we see there today, but. Uh, they are not the subject of uh, my talk this evening. The subject of my talk uh, are the elephant birds. You see three of them here. Um, on, the, on the far right, there is an ostrich for scale and, and a human being. Um, there are now four species of uh, these elephant birds recognized. There were until recently seven, but there's been a a new analysis of, uh, of the remains of their bones. And there are now uh, said to be uh, four um, from, the, uh, from the left, Mularonis, and then the wonderfully named Vurumbe Titans. Vurumbe means big bird in Malagasy. And so you've got a titanic big bird, which I think is an apt description for the largest bird that has ever walked the earth. Uh, and then to the right of the human outline, you see Apionis hildebrandi, uh, who, a very interesting critter uh, who I'll be coming back to uh, later. So I, I, my, 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 my talk is entitled Elephant Bird Enigmas, and uh, there are three that I want to focus on this evening, though in fact, there are, there are several more. The first is when and how did the ancestors of these gigantic flightless birds arrive in Madagascar? The second is, what did they do for a living? And the third is, why did they go extinct? And uh, I call them enigmas because uh, for un it, it, the answers to the questions are becoming clearer, but only just and only partially and there is still a wonderful mystery that attaches to them. So let's start with the question of where did they come from? So look at the top left hand uh, in this figure, the top left hand uh, uh, image uh, of uh, where Madagascar was 170 million years ago. Basically, it was a completely inconsequential wedge of land in the middle of Gondwana. Uh, with South America and Africa and India, uh, Antarctica and Australia uh, uh, surrounding it. And uh, until very recently, it was assumed that uh, the, 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 the giant flightless birds uh, that we see in the world today, notably the ostrich and of course the recently extinct moa in New Zealand, but the cassowary and the emu as well, that these birds kind of walked out of Gondwana uh, and uh, took up residence as the continents drifted apart. So, you know, so that was the prevailing wisdom about these animals. 
Uh, now go down to the bottom right, 60 million years ago. Madagascar is now an island. It is completely surrounded by deep water. The Mozambique Channel separating Madagascar uh, from Africa 60 million years ago was already uh, three or 400 kilometers wide, depending where you measure it. So on to the next. It turns out that uh, the, the, the um, elephant birds of Madagascar uh, only evolved uh, over the last 50 million years ago. Their closest living relative, this is based on molecular evidence, their closest living relative is the kiwi of New Zealand. So what are we to make of that? Uh, the answer is that when these birds dispersed, they didn't disperse as huge flightless birds from Gondwana walking across the landscape. Uh, the ancestor of Madagascar's elephant birds was a small bird that flew. It flew from uh, New Zealand, which was already thousands of miles uh, to the east of Madagascar. And from there, uh, the ancestor of these birds diversified, evolved, and gigantism emerged as it did uh, on other continents. Um, and the question of why gigantism evolved is, is, is itself an interesting one, which I will not go into this evening. But, and I suspect that you, you, you already know the generally accepted answer, which is that gigantism can, can evolve uh, uh, either as a defense against predators or because there are no predators, it doesn't matter if you are not cryptic, if you, uh, if you can't hide yourself easily. So, so that is the, 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 the story of their history. They, the, their ancestors, as I say, dates back about 50 million years. Uh, they have been evolving since then. This paper was published in 2014 and uh, says that there were seven species of elephant bird. Uh, uh, as, as I say, that number has now been reduced to four, possibly five, based on uh, uh, analysis of the, their material remains. So moving then to the second question, what did they do for a living? Uh, I, I put up just two, uh, uh, two the, the, the distribution of the remains, uh, the subfossil remains, of two species here, uh, Apionis hild, hild whoops, that's gone. I've, got, I've done this. Sorry, hitch with the photographs. Okay, uh, uh, Apionis hildebrandi, and uh, I, I'm trying to get rid of this screen here. Uh, sorry, and Mulleronis. Uh, so. Just sort of pause for a moment and look at, at, look at these maps. Uh, and it tells you something about uh, the challenge that one faces in reconstructing what happened and what was going on. Um, there are plentiful, dense concentrations of elephant bird eggshell way up on the seashore uh, on the northern tip of Madagascar. And yet there is not a single subfossil remain remains found in this whole northern area of the island. So we know that we're only see we know that they were there. Their remains have just not yet been found. So the picture remains incomplete. But uh, if you look first uh, here uh, on the left uh, at Mulleronis. Uh, they, their remains have been mostly found in the south, in the drier parts of the island, in the, in the succulent woodlands and in the arid spiny forest. Apionis hildebrandi uh, is found in the central highlands uh, where grasslands and forests uh, intermingle and intermix through time. This creature over here on Belusia Mare uh, it, it may actually not, it, it, it's uncertain whether that belongs to the same species. But let's look at these two in turn. First, 
at the birds that were living in the south in the spiny forests and then at the birds in the central highlands. The spiny forest, pictures like this, photographs like this, when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge, were what first completely captivated me about Madagascar, this strange silvery spiny forest with its, uh, its remarkable Dideria species reaching their fingers to the sky. Uh, the forests are dominated by this family of plants found nowhere else in the world. Um, what has emerged uh, is that uh, giant flightless birds go hand in hand with spiny forests that are also springy forests. Uh, this connection was made by uh, 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 a, a, a distinguished ecologist, uh, uh, William Bond. Um, and as he pointed out, the spiny forest isn't only a spiny forest, it's actually also a springy forest. And it almost certainly co-evolved uh, with these giant flightless birds. What do we mean by a springy forest? Um, if you are a bird with a beak, your ability to snap off uh, uh, twigs is quite well developed. But these branches can't be snapped. They're springy. I put this photograph in because a few minutes after this conversation began, uh, he, he gathered up one of these, uh, one of the ends, the tips of these long spiny branches between his teeth. And then with gritted teeth, said to us, as he swayed back and forth, said, see, it's a springy forest. It's not just a spiny forest. So it would seem that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the relationship between these strange, unique forests of the South uh, that emerged over the last 50 million years is integrally tied up with the foraging habits of the flightless birds. Uh, and that uh, the forest evolved defenses that made it more difficult for these birds to browse on these species. And uh, much the same is seen in Southern Africa uh, with ostriches very interestingly. So moving from there up to the grasslands, um, the story changes again. The way that we know something about what these birds ate is because uh, there are isotopic traces, signals, uh, radioactive signals of uh, the plants that they ingested. And there is a clear distinction between the signals left by woody plants and the signals left by grasses. Uh, and uh, Apionis hildebrandi, uh, whose remains have been found in the central highlands, uh, shows a clear signal of having fed on grasses. Now, this in itself is very interesting because the prevailing wisdom about Madagascar is that it was entirely forested until the fill in the adjective, the wicked, stupid, destructive, ignorant Malagasy people arrived and cut down much of the forest or burned it down. Uh, but what we are seeing both from the diversity of plants and the, uh, uh, the levels of uh, of, of endemic grass species in Madagascar, but also from uh, animals like uh, this elephant bird, uh, that there was there were not only grasslands there, but there were animals that constituted a grazing community. So here is your grazing community. Uh, a giant now extinct lemur called Hydropithecus, uh, two or possibly three species of hippopotamus. This is a, an African hippopotamus out on uh, 
what's called a grazing lawn due to uh, its habits, uh, there were three species of giant tortoises, now extinct, like the hippo, like the giant lemur. Uh, these uh, uh, giant tortoises were actually photographed uh, on Aldabra Island, uh, which is the only island in the West Indian Ocean which still has uh, giant tortoises. As, as you all know, there are giant tortoises in the Galapagos Islands, but in the West Indian Ocean, this is uh, Aldabra is where giant tortoises are to be found today. But uh, until the, the a thousand years ago or so, uh, Madagascar had giant tortoises too. And then back to our stars of the evening, uh, there were flightless birds. Uh, Apionis uh, Hildebrandi. The other, the other flightless birds all seem to have been browsers feeding, feeding on woody plants. But, uh, but, but Hildebrandi was a good grazer. So, contrary to long-standing beliefs, uh, Madagascar may not have had giraffes and wildebeest and zebra, but uh, it is as if nature improvised with what was to hand uh, and produced a community of grazers that uh, proliferated and flourished after grasslands began spreading around the world in the subtropics between four and seven million years ago. So, so far, uh, what I have been uh, uh, talking about uh, relates to a time when elephant birds flourished, giant tortoises flourished, hippos flourished, these giant lemurs flourished. Uh, but uh, in the last uh, thousand years, 500 years, uh, all of the largest animals, the largest spotted animals have disappeared. What happened? So what you're looking at here are the uh, leg bones, two leg bones of two elephant birds. Uh, the dating on these bones is solid. It's good, the dating is good. It's uh, radiocarbon dating. They're 10,000 years old or thereabouts. Um, but what you also can see on these bones uh, some curious marks. Study of those marks using a scanning electron microscope uh, makes it clear or pretty clear that these marks were made by stone tools being wielded by people. What you're looking at here is the earliest evidence of people on the island 10,000 years ago. Uh, and it comes from two elephant bird leg bones. Now, you may ask, sort of, how can we be confident of that? Uh, you know, how do we know that this is not crocodile teeth? How do we know that it is not just pieces of jagged stone uh, you know, making marks on these bones, or even indeed the spade of an archaeologist or a paleontologist digging them up? And the answer to that question is that those that different ways of incising bone, different ways of kind of attacking bone, leave characteristically different marks. And so it is with uh, it is with considerable confidence that one looks at these bones and says, "Okay, there were people here on the island a thousand, ten thousand years ago." As I say, that's the it's the earliest evidence of uh, human presence. Then you go forward, the, 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 the record is silent, nothing has been found until you get to 6,000 years ago. And once again, it's elephant birds that are the stars with two more bones, two more leg bones with uh, cut marks, chop marks made by stone tools. Then you fast forward, uh, with nothing found, nothing found to show evidence of uh, a blitzkrieg of hunting to the eighth century. 
And, uh, and there is one more, again, elephant bird bone that has been found in the eighth century. Um, but the extraordinary thing about this is these bones have been, these bones were found in isolation. They were found at the bottom of limestone caves. They were not found in human settlement sites. Uh, the, the only uh, extinct large animal uh, whose remains have been found uh, in a settlement site were actually from a uh, rock shelter 4,000 years old that was excavated by my husband where they found the jaw of a giant lemur. Um, but those foraging sites were very few and far between. It isn't until the eighth century that uh, the human footprint in Madagascar begins to spread. Uh, but you look into these settlements, they've dozens of these settlements, 50, 60 of these settlements from the eighth, between the eighth and the 11th century have been uh, excavated by archeologists in meticulous detail. And nowhere do you find the remains, the bone remains of animals, of these extinct animals. You find animals, the remains of animals that are alive today, but not uh, of these uh, of these giant animals. It is a very, very curious uh, phenomenon. And uh, you know, one explanation is that people killed these big animals and ate them wherever they killed them and didn't bring, didn't bring them back to their camps or their villages. Um, Another explanation is that these animals live at low density and reproduce slowly, and you don't have to kill very many uh, or very often. You can be a really incompetent opportunistic hunter, but if you hunt slowly but steadily over a few centuries, uh, eventually the populations will reach a threshold where they can't find mates and extinction follows from that. But what I want to say here is that uh, for the best part of 9,000 years, humans were on Madagascar and there is no indication that there was any decline in the populations of these large animals, including the elephant birds. You only begin to see signs of decline around the ninth century. Uh, I take that for our species as some kind of glimmer of hope in, these, in this dark world in which we live. Uh, it is possible, it was possible uh, in Madagascar for people to live uh, with these amazing creatures for thousands and thousands of years. It was not the fact of human presence that did them in, it was what people did. Uh, and uh, it was a change to, uh, a lifestyle of, of, of farming and livestock husbandry and increasing density accompanied by slow uh, um, uh, opportunistic hunting. So that uh, after the decline about 900, you know, in the ninth century began of these animals, uh, they were all gone by uh, the 15th century. Now, I want to go back uh, and uh, just think a little more about this question of hunting. If, if you go to Wikipedia and you uh, ask the question, what are the fiercest, fiercest birds in the world, which I did just for amusement to see what would come up, three of the six species of the fiercest birds in the world belong to the family of uh, of, of flightless birds, uh, of large flightless birds. I mean, I, I think, uh, 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 you know, you will know uh, the, uh, the tales of cassowaries and the evidence of cassowaries disemboweling people, killing people. I mean, that's going on in our own time. These birds are fierce. Some of you may have come across Tim Lowe's wonderful book about uh, the birds of Australia, How Song Began, where he, he explores at some length why Australia's birds are particularly fierce. Um, but it has certainly, uh, I have wondered whether Madagascar's 
elephant birds were also particularly fierce. And uh, to my uh, astonishment, as I was doing the research for this book, I discovered that not only did William Burroughs uh, write a novella about Madagascar, that, which I found to be very strange, but a hundred years ago, H.G. Wells wrote a book called Apionis Island, which was first published uh, in Pearson's magazine in 1905, um, and, uh, and then was published as a short book about uh, a sort of a, a, a terminal battle. I won't spoil it for you, but it was a terminal battle between uh, uh, a human being and an Apionis. And in the end, uh, the human won but it was a close run thing. So I have wondered whether in fact, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of hunting of Apionis that went on. There is a, uh, a remarkable 17th century account by an early French traveler to Madagascar describing an encounter uh, with an elephant bird and maybe he made it up uh, or maybe he embroidered it, but uh, it certainly sounds, it's vivid and fearsome and quite plausible to me. But let, let us sort of assume then that uh, just for a moment that, uh, that elephant birds uh, were fierce, that the evidence or lack of evidence, I should say, of, uh, of, of the consumption of these birds because the lack of any evidence of uh, uh, from you know, physical remains, um, there is another possible explanation for their extinction. And that has to do with egg theft. Uh, what you see here is uh, uh, an Apionis maximus uh, egg, intact egg. I took this photograph uh, many years ago in the south of Madagascar. And alongside it, I, uh, I sat uh, a chicken's egg. So contemplate that for a few minutes. Um, it would make a hell of an omelet, uh, that, that, that egg. Um, but what it would also do is serve as a container. And indeed, up until the 19th century, uh, Malagasy were using uh, these eggs with, uh, with a, a carefully uh, carved out, chipped out uh, opening at the top to carry liquids around. Uh, there are beads that have been found just as ostrich beads were an important trade item in Africa. So uh, beads made from uh, elephant bird eggshell uh, may have uh, uh, been important. And what we do know is that the Southern beaches of Madagascar are littered with very dense, um, accumulations of broken eggshell. Now, the problem with interpreting that is that they were probably colony nesters and they probably nested on these sandy beaches and incubated their egg in the, in the sand. And so when one sees these, uh, these fields, fields of shattered shell, uh, it's not, evident and there is no way that anybody has yet uh, discovered to figure out whether these were shells uh, shattered by people going after the yolks uh, or just for the for the value of the shell itself or whether they were in fact areas of, of, of nesting colonies uh, where birds uh, uh, were safely born and and, uh, and 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 grew to maturity but but certainly uh, egg theft, it would seem, uh, would at least be a safer way of uh, uh, use making, exploiting elephant birds and maybe a better explanation of this, uh, of the evidence or lack of evidence that, that we see with respect to their remains. But that brings me to, uh, my question uh, for you uh, this evening. Um, this but, uh, bird eggshell egg sizes uh, are correlated with the body sizes of birds. And if you look, if you plot the body sizes 
of this whole family, the, the large flightless birds and their smaller cousins. As you can see, body size and egg weight, which is a proxy for egg size, map very closely, except with respect to the kiwi and the apionis. Both the kiwi and the apionis, for their size, had larger eggs uh, than the rest of this family. What does that mean? Uh, what it means is that the egg would take longer to produce, the egg would take longer to incubate, uh, and likely uh, the chicks would take longer to mature. This is very interesting. Uh, one of the reasons I became so interested in the large white lemurs that I've been studying all these years is they live their lives in the slow lane. Uh, they're the size of your average domestic pussycat, uh, but half of the females uh, that I have studied, and I've studied the sample size is now 800 or so over many years, they haven't given birth for the first time by the time they're seven years old. Imagine a domestic cat that doesn't give birth until it's seven years old. They live routinely until they're 30 and keep producing. They only have one offspring and they only have an offspring every other year or so. It's life in the slow lane. The reason for that is that uh, Madagascar has a hypervariable environment and has done for millions of years. Uh, it's an unpredictable environment. And in the face of unpredictability, um, animals either speed up their life history patterns, how fast they grow up, reproduce, give birth and die, or they slow them down. Either you hedge your bets and live a long life and reproduce slowly, or you take advantage of good conditions when they come and you reproduce very fast. Uh, what we have learned in the last decade or so is that uh, all of the mammals for which we have data show this pattern of very fast and very slow reproduction. Reptiles, insofar as we know, show this pattern of very fast or very slow lives. I stumbled across this particular uh, slide, this particular graph, uh, doing research for this lecture this evening. It was buried in the supplementary materials of a, a very, very detailed paper, paper about the, uh, the molecular phylogeny of this group, which I barely understood. But this just jumped right off the page at me, and it made me think, aha, Maybe birds, maybe these critters uh, were also struggling with survival in an unpredictable environment. And maybe in order to survive, you either had to slow down your life history or speed it up. Some succeeded and some did not. If I'm right, it would be an explanation for the low diversity of birds in Madagascar. It might be an explanation for the absence of the hornbills, the woodpeckers and the honey guides, birds that uh, didn't make the, the leap, as it were, to adapting the way that they lived their lives to the, uh, the, 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 the very distinct and, uh, uh, and difficult conditions of life in Madagascar. And, and maybe I thought, here is some evidence that this might be so. So in, in concluding uh, my, my talk tonight, and I, I'm, I, you know, so, you know, yes, indeed, uh, the reality is my, my heart belongs to elephant birds. However, I am really interested in learning whether the extant birds the living birds of Madagascar uh, show uh, signs of being curious, having reproducing only intermittently, uh, having long lives or particularly short lives or particularly small uh, 
uh, uh, uh, numbers of, of, of eggs. Uh, uh, and I have not been able to find any evidence about that. I don't know whether that is known. And so my question to all of you is, do you have thoughts or ideas or evidence about uh, the, the life histories of uh, Madagascar's living birds that might add another clue to the uh, to the sort of the evolving story of this unique and magical uh, and uh, enigmatic uh, group of animals from lemurs to tortoises uh, to giant birds and to the birds that we see today. Uh, so I thank you very much. And uh, I'm very interested to hear. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you may have. I've covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time, but I thought it was, uh, uh, I'd, I'd prefer, I'd, I'd rather leave time uh, to, to talk amongst ourselves and to answer your questions and to hear what you have to say. Uh, so I will stop there and go back to uh, the full, the, the screen share and uh, we'll